When God gives you an assignment, he provides the means to accomplish it. That's just a good reminder right there. Whether you are parenting littles or somewhere overseas in global missions or any kind of calling in between, God's going to equip you for the things he's called you to do. Every good work. David declared he trains my arms for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. Training, right? God will give you what you need to do the thing he's called you to do. When Jesus gave his disciples an assignment, he gave them clear instruction, but he also gave them the power and the authority to accomplish the assignment. I love the fresh perspective that the message translation of the Bible shines on this happening in Mark chapter six. It says, Jesus called the 12 to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority, someone say authority, and power, say power, to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds, keep it simple. No luxury inns, get a modest place and be content there until you leave. And if you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw, don't make a scene, just shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached and joyful, with joyful urgency that life can be radically different Right and left, they sent the demons packing. Yes. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. How beautiful is God's word. And then Jesus released this dirty dozen on their mission, and he reminded them that there would be demonic oppression and opposition along the way. He told them to expect it, right? Which serves us as a reminder today, church, that even when we're doing exactly what the Lord called us to do, we can expect opposition. Expect it. We can expect persecution, rejection. We can encounter oppression and even evil spirits along the way. Doesn't the Bible teach us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are in continually engaged in a spiritual battle? I'll remind you, Ephesians chapter six says, finally be strong in the Lord. Someone say strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but listen to this. It's against rulers. It's against authorities, against powers of the dark world and against spiritual forces in evil, of evil in the heavenly realms. It's an invisible battle, but it's real. Sometimes we forget the opposition is par for the course. But we can't afford to forget that. Because when we forget that, we can become easily sabotaged by disappointment, discouragement, disillusionment, doubt that God's going to do what he said he's going to do, or even doubt that God's even real. And we waver in our faith because we're discouraged because we had to fight a fight. What? <laughs> Today, I have it on my heart to remind the church to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and start exercising your spiritual authority against every tactic of the enemy. Every tactic. In Acts chapter 16, we get a glimpse of that authority and that strength in the life of Paul. The story is told by Paul's friend Luke. It says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God 
and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This young lady had a demonic spirit that actually gave her the, the power, the supernatural power to be a fortune teller, to tell the truth. I mean, honestly, it's interesting, isn't it? Because she was right about Paul and Silas. They really were servants of the Most High God. They really were preaching about how to get saved, teaching people how to be released from the grip of sin. Church, this is just a heads up that sometimes even demonic spirits tell the truth. But what this young lady was saying wasn't the problem. The problem was because of the demonic spirit at work within her, she had become a major distraction to what God wanted to do through Paul and Silas. Have you ever been distracted? Distraction is a work of the enemy. Have you ever set out to do something and then found yourself doing something else? I used to have this cat that every time I sat down to write a message for Sunday, Dr. Pumpkin would jump up on the desk and pace back and forth across the keyboard of my computer. And I'm sorry, Emmy, but one day I just threw her. (laughs) Sorry, Em. She landed on all four feet like cats do. (laughs) Rest her soul. Dr. Pumpkin. She's good. She's good. (laughs) And now I have a dog (laughs) named Piper Joe. He's Amish. (laughs) And I can promise you that anytime I'm writing a message or anytime that I get up early to pray, the dog instantly starts grumbling in his crate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it is the most annoying distraction. (laughs) Or how about you, if, if ever you just reach for your Bible and you thought, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to look up this scripture online, so I need Google, right? So I look at my phone, I pull up the safari, I look, and then I don't even know how it happens. I'm on looking at furry kitty cats on Instagram. I'm scrolling on cute animals instead. Have you ever done that? And an hour passes by and you're like, what was I doing? Oh, I reached for my phone to find a scripture. Anybody know what I'm talking about? About being distracted. Distractions can sometimes be cute <laughs> and fuzzy and, and warm. And, but listen, the enemy will always try to distract you from your assignment. Sometimes he will use people or situations that seem harmless. Right? They sound right, they seem right, they look right. And sometimes a distraction, as innocent as it seems, is a tactic from the pit of hell to keep you from doing what God wanted you to do. That's what was happening in this story. This slave girl followed them everywhere, the Bible says. And she would not stop talking and shouting these guys are from the servant of the Most High. Can you, pack, can you picture it? They're here to tell you how to get saved. Have you ever met? Oh, I won't go there. But you know the kind of things I'm talking about. The slave girl was saying all the right things, but Paul had the discernment to see the source of his distraction. Acts chapter 16 verse 18 says, this went on day after day until Paul became so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Take heart, church. Demons still flee at the name of Jesus Christ. They still flee. Paul had the ability to discern what he was dealing with, but not only the ability to see it, but the ability and the courage to call it what it was and to cast it out. And the spirit left. Now, I don't know about you, but I love that Paul got fed up. And not only did he get fed up, but he stood up. And then he called it out and he spoke up. 
Sometimes, if you're like me, we get stuck in the fed up part. We know we're being discouraged. We know we're being affected. We, we know we can feel it in the room. We know what's going on. We can sense it. We can see it. We can even smell it. We know that there's something that we're dealing with, but we get stuck in the fed up part. But church, it's time to get up and speak up in the authority that God has given us as believers in Jesus Christ. Paul had the ability to discern And like Paul, we need to pray for the spiritual gift of discernment so that we can see things for what they really are. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the different gifts of the Spirit. The gift of discernment is one of them. Where you can discern, is this a spirit or is this just humanity? Because please, please, please don't call out demons at the DMV this week. (laughs) you need the gift of discernment. Don't go chasing devils around town or in your home, please. You need discernment. You need to know what you're dealing with. You need to see it clearly, stand up and speak up so that we can sense what we're dealing with, call the distraction what it is and resist it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now distractions can show up in many different ways. Sometimes they are in the form of a temptation. Sometimes they are in the form of a strange misunderstanding that you don't even know how it started. Have you ever been in an argument and you can't remember how it got, like, it's a, it's a confusion, a chaos, something you can't put your finger on. Sometimes it's, it's a, a irrational conflict that can't be solved. Sometimes it shows up in emotions that that come over us for no apparent reasons. Situations that make us go, what's what's happening? What's going on? Something is off. And if you're a feeler like me today, you know what I'm talking about. You can walk into the room and if there's something in the room, you, you just, you can't put your finger on it but God's given you the gift of discernment and you feel it. And sometimes I'll confess, I get stuck in the feeling part. I can walk into a room where I know that something is off and I feel it. And if I'm not careful, it can bring me down. Feelers know what I'm saying. Now, we all have a different way that we have a discernment or the way we hear from God's voice. There are people who know what God is saying. There are people who had a vision or dream of what God is saying. There are people who actually hear a voice or an audible voice from God. And then there's us feelers. And I have whined and complained about being a feeler because I don't feel good sometimes. It's great when you feel joy. It's great when you walk into a room like this morning and you feel victory because of the anointing on Josh Jordan as he leads worship. And James and the rest of the team, like you feel that anointing and you can't wait to get into the room and you can't wait to be a part of the praise and the worship, but we can't get stuck on the feeling part because God's called us to wage war. He's training us for battle and we need to get to the place where we don't just feel that something is off, but we stand up and we speak up and we call it what it is and we send it packing in the name of Jesus. We have to get beyond the feeling part. We need to be strong in the Lord. Somebody say, I'm strong in the Lord. I know what it's like to be overcome with sadness for no apparent reason, but I'm learning to speak up. Oh, I see you, spirit of despair, and I bind you in the name of Jesus, and I'm gonna put on my garment of praise. I know what it's like to feel unworthy of God's approval. Yes, I do. But I'm learning to speak up and say, oh, I see you religious Pharisee spirit, but God's grace is greater than all my sin and I know who I am in him, through him, Christ in me. We need to fight the religious spirit. I know what it's like up to what I know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night with terror looking me right in the face. I've seen it. And it's ugly 
and it's terrifying and I've woken up screaming because of what I saw in my face, in my room. And I'm not telling you that to scare anyone today. I'm telling you that when we see it, we detect it, we sense it, we get fed up, we stand up and we speak up. Oh, I see you, fear. But God has not given me a spirit of fear. He's given me power and love and sound mind. I resist you in the name of Jesus. And then we watch the spirits leave. Why? Because the authority that God has given us, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. You need to remember that greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. It's time to pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. It's time to learn how to shift the atmosphere. We have the power and the authority to do that. We do it when we praise. We do it when we worship. We do it when we pray. We've been singing about it all morning. Did you feel the atmosphere shift in this house? When James started speaking, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And guys, this isn't just for us. This is for our children too. I feel so strongly on my heart now for a long, long time. I've been sensing that it's time we stop protecting our children from the spiritual battles and we start training our children for spiritual battle. Our children need to know how to be strong in the Lord. Do you think this world is going to get any easier for Christians? Perhaps they need to know how to be strong in the Lord more than we ever did. It's time to train our children, teaching them to pray, teaching the weapon that is their praise. And I'm not suggesting that we get weird. I'll say it again for the people in the back. I'm not suggesting we get weird. Elbow your neighbor and say, don't get weird. We can have authority without changing our voice. We can have authority without screaming. We can have authority without an ugly face and looking like angry Christian soldiers. We can have authority like a meek authority. Meekness, bridled strength, right? Here's an example. Good police officer, right? Have you ever been pulled over by a good policeman? I have. Now, what do they do? Do they stand on the curb shouting, slow down! I said slow down right now! Do they do that? Never. Do they chase you down, waving their hands and flailing their hands with big, shouty, ugly faces? Nope, they turn their little lights on and you go, And you pull over and then they come up to your car and do they scream and yell and shout and get ugly and mean? No, they say, I'd like to have your license and registration, please, ma'am. And you go, "Ah, I'm so sorry. And you submit, right? That was a really good parenting tip for those of you who might have caught it. Somebody say, good parenting tip. Screaming doesn't equate authority. Screaming means we're out of control. Bonus, that was free. The demonic spirit left the young girl, verse 19. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. Uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison, The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, someone say midnight. 
Paul and Silas were moaning, groaning, complaining, and giving up. No. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. So I want to challenge someone today to keep praying and keep singing in your midnight hour. Ephesians 6.12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world. Do you know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night discouraged? It's not your cue to pick up your phone. It's your cue to pray. I've been doing a lot of that. Proverbs 31 speaks of a woman who rises while it is yet night. Even Jesus himself, the Bible says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You mean I'm not supposed to lay there and worry for two hours? It's your cue to pray. It's your cue to war in the darkness. It's your cue to go to battle in prayer like Jesus did, like Paul and Silas did. In this story, Paul and Silas doing spiritual battle, praying and singing hymns when in the middle of the darkness. The enemy's turf. They were cold. They were bleeding, they were hurting, they had heavy shackles on their feet. Oh, I see you fear. I see you discouragement. I see you. I see you. Acts chapter 16, 25 says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Church, there's always going to be someone paying attention to what you do in your midnight hour. Our children need to hear us praying. Our spouses need to hear us praying. Our family and our friends need to hear us praying, audibly. They need to hear it because there's a sound that is released and shifts the atmosphere when we open our mouths and pray, when we open our mouths and sing, when we open our mouths and declare he is Lord over my circumstance, no matter what I'm going through, there's always someone listening to how you respond to your midnight hour. And I don't know who's watching you and I don't know who's listening to you and I don't know who's paying attention to how you handle your prison experience, but I believe somebody is going to experience freedom because of your praise. Verse 25 says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open. And the chains of every prisoner, someone say every prisoner, fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop. Don't kill yourself. I see you, spirit of suicide. But death is not your comforter. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. And I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you this, spiritual warfare is never only about you. The enemy sees your destiny. The enemy sees the destiny of your children and your children's children. And don't you think for a second that he's not trying to stop it. Of course he wants to stop you. Of course he wants to silence you and discourage you. Oh, I see you, spirit of darkness. But excuse me while I worship the light of the world. Oh, I see you restraining, restricting Python spirit. But in the presence of God, I hear chains falling today. In him I move. In him I breathe and have my being. In Jesus' name. 
the chains of every prisoner fell off. And remember, the prisoners in that jail cell weren't the only ones who were freed that day. There was another captive in this story, the slave girl. And may we never forget that because there was a man of God who got fed up, stood up, and spoke up, she was freed in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. I believe God's looking for men and women who will get fed up. Is anybody ready to get fed up? Is anybody ready to stand up? Is anybody ready to speak up in the authority that God is giving you. As the worship team comes, I believe God is setting people free today. And oh, what a commotion that must have been going on in that prison that night. Acts chapter 16, verse 29 says, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and he asked, sirs, What must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in the household. And even at that hour in the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. And he brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. I want to remind you that God's still preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here today and you're And you're asking the same question that the jailer asked, what what must I do to be saved? Maybe you've never received Jesus into your life. Maybe you've never made the decision to accept the Lord God as your personal Lord and Savior. I wanna tell you that Jesus paid the price for your freedom. And there is hope in Jesus Christ for everyone who believes. I believe that desperate people are still asking the question, what must I do, what must I do, what must I do? And the answer is the same as it's always been. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved.